Good morning and happy Social Work Month, everyone. My name is Annette Johns, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. I will be the moderator for today's education event, Parent Alienation, a review of current literature and practice implications. The webinar presentation will be approximately 60 minutes, followed by a 30 minute question and answer period that I will moderate. Please note that all the details you need, like how to access the slide deck and other housekeeping information is under the announcement and housekeeping widget. All the widgets can be customized and, re and resized uh, by clicking the blue and white icons at the bottom of your window. So you can move those around and resize them for your viewing pleasure. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions using the question mark icon at any time, and I'll begin asking them at the end of the presentation. Please note that only the presenter and I can see the questions. I now want to introduce our speaker, Brian Kinney. Brian is a registered social worker and has been in practice for over 25 years. He has a master's degree in social work from Memorial University and is a fellow of the School of Graduate Studies. Brian provides a wide range of counseling services in private practice, and his work focuses primarily upon the post-divorce environment, including custody and access issues, helping parents um, help their children through the separation process and et cetera. Brian, through Kenny Assessment Services Incorporated, completes parenting assessments for the family court and has been declared an expert witness in matters pertaining to child custody and the assessment of parent capacity. I'm so pleased that Brian is delivering this webinar for us today as we kick off our Social Work Month celebrations. And on that note, I'll now pass the virtual podium over to Brian to begin the presentation. Okay, well, uh, good morning, folks, and uh, thank you so much for, for being here and uh, attending this presentation. Um, I'd like to keep this uh, very uh, informal, uh, so uh, I have a, a presentation here uh, that I'd like to walk through. Um, maybe before I do that, I can just tell you a little bit about the work that I do. So. Uh, I do uh, parenting capacity assessments uh, for the family court. Uh, some people call them home studies. And um, those are in situations where there's a high conflict child custody situation going on. But I also do uh, assessments uh, for CSSD, uh, where there's uh, children placed in foster care in, in, in caregiver homes and um, a parenting capacity assessment is, is required. Um, so separate from that, I also work at Aspens and Oaks, which uh, many of you know is a private counseling clinic here in St. John's. And uh, I work with a lot of people who are involved in the, in the post-separation environment. And a lot of them uh, are involved in high conflict child custody situations. And um, separate from that, again, at Aspen and Oaks, um, I provide uh, mediation services uh, for couples who want to develop a, um, a co-parenting arrangement. Now, I, I don't do a lot of that, probably about one of those files a, a year. Uh, many people who are looking for mediation go to Family Justice Services. And um, they actually have an excellent reputation. I, I, I don't know any of the workers who, who work in family justice services who, who provide mediation, but I know them by reputation. Uh, they, uh, they have an excellent reputation for providing really high quality mediation services for people uh, who are trying to develop a, a co-parenting arrangement. Um, but for various reasons, sometimes people are looking for a private mediator. So I, I, I do that type of work as well. So, um, yeah, so that's a little bit about myself and uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll get started. Okay. So, um, I'm just gonna get used to the technology here. Um, now folks, just a few statistics. Uh, the divorce rate in Canada is, uh, 40%. Um, so you'll hear people say that the divorce rate is one in two couples get divorced, right? And that's sort of been thrown around for years, almost like it's, it's self-evident. Well, it's, it's not, it's not 50%, it's, it's actually 40%. And the other thing that you'll hear people say is that the, you know, the divorce rate is skyrocketed and it's just gone completely out of control. And well, that's not true either. 
In, in fact, the divorce rate over time has been fairly stable over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. In fact, it may even have gone down a little bit. Um, but it, it is true that for many couples who separate, uh, many uh, marriages end within the first eight years. And um, many of these people, as you know, have, um, have young children involved. So uh, we're going to ask you some questions here uh, as we go along, some polls and stuff like that, just to um, just for a bit of fun. So here's the first one. According to the General Social Survey uh, of 2017, the majority of couples living together are A, married or uh, B, living common law. So i um, just wondering if you folks could just take a minute and um, and answer that question for me. Okay, so I'll just give you a few more seconds there now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right, so let's see what the results of that is. Okay, uh, so um, the answer to that question is most uh, couples uh, today are married, okay? So it's uh, it's not um, a big percentage. It's it's fifty four percent, but uh, yeah, um, most couples nowadays are married. But the as you probably can just uh, guess from uh, just everyday life, uh, the uh, percentage of people who are uh, living together as opposed to uh, getting married um, is raising is rising every every year. Um, and what's interesting is that if you looked at the research from, say, 20 years ago, and you looked at the research about uh, comparing married couples to couples living common law, the research 20 years ago would say that people who marry are more likely to stay together than people who are living common law. The research that's uh, been done recently on that is a little bit more, or it's a little less uh, confident in making that statement. Um, so um, it's going to be interesting to see as, as time goes on if, uh, if uh, more people are just simply going to continue to live common law, and if the uh, notion that by being married, um, that, that that somehow promotes a more successful likelihood of an out, a positive outcome if that's um, if that's going to play itself out so we'll, we'll see where that goes now one of the things that i find interesting is uh, a research study uh, completed um, by the university of alberta just a few years ago where it says that um, research indicates that cohabiting couples are more likely to split up than their married counterparts in the first two years after having children. Um, so it's, it's interesting that um, I think that if you were to speak to um, lawyers, family law lawyers who just deal exclusively in family law, uh, who just spend all of their uh, legal practice in child custody work. I think many of them will tell you that even though the birth rate has declined in recent years, that um, people are, are having less children, um, that their work is as busy as ever. That um, yes, there's um, less children, um, but uh, breakups are still occurring steadily and um, and the uh, amount of um, people fighting over child custody is, is, is as strong as it's ever been, unfortunately. So the good news is that most people two years after a separation will get to a place where they're able to ignore, tolerate, or have some measure of cooperation with the other parent. And, and, and that's the good news. And in fact, many people will tell me that when they separated, um, they just sat down with their ex and they put together a custody and access arrangement. They sat down with a piece of paper 
and they just worked it out themselves or they never actually have it in writing, but they've just developed this routine that works for them. So there's a lot of people in that category who just uh, figure out a way to, to co-parent and coexist with their ex. And that's, that's very encouraging. But unfortunately, um, there is a, a group of people, a group of, of parents, about five to 10 percent, who will remain stuck in conflict or, or high conflict. And these are the people who take up an incredible amount of the court's time and an incredible amount of uh, time um, uh, with uh, counselors and uh, professionals associated with the court system, uh, child welfare authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that um, rears its ugly head uh, in the post-separation environment uh, is something called parent alienation. And so PA refers to the overt and covert behaviors displayed by a parent which attempts to undermine the other parent's relationship with his or her child. So I just want to put forth some definitions here now. So as we go along, we are clear about some, some basic terms. Um, parent alienation refers to the parent's behavior, what the parent is doing overtly or covertly to try to undermined the other parent's relationship with the children. Parent alienation syndrome refers to the child who has been successfully turned against the, the targeted parent. So PA refers to the parent's behavior. PAS refers to the extent to which that behavior has successfully impacted upon the child such that they've turned against the other parent. OK. So in this regard, there is a distinction between mild, moderate and severe categories of alienation. So the mild type, uh, it's really just subtle attempts to alienate. Um, the, the parent is generally supportive of the child having a relationship with the other parent. But this is the type of parent who doesn't mind getting in their digs as it were. So there's a lot of uh, eye rolling whenever the, uh, uh, the other parent's name is mentioned. And uh, there's just sort of this sense that, um, yeah, I don't really have much time or patience for the other one. But despite all that, um, they are generally supportive of their child having a, a relationship um, um, with, their, with the other parent. And then there's the moderate type. Uh, parents may support the concept of a relationship between the child and the alienated parent, but will concurrently attempts to sabotage. So if I can give you some examples of, of sabotage, this is a situation where um, a parent shows up to pick up their kids for a weekend visit and uh, or weekend access, as it's as it's called. And uh, the uh, the parent says, oh, I lost track of time and the kids are up at their friend's house. So, um, yeah, I'm going to have to go up and get them now. Or, uh, oh, geez, I lost track of time and the kids are they're up in the tub. Or uh, there's just something there that's constantly creating problems for the other parent to have access. There just seems to be all these little... Um, passive aggressive behaviors on the part of the alienating parent. It is still, the, the access still occurs, uh, but there's all these little um, nuisance things that get put in the person's way uh, to allow them to have uh, a smooth transition and smooth access to their, to their kids. And then there's the severe form of parent alienation. And this is a clear, consistent denigration of the alienated parent uh, by the alienating parent. So uh, we talk about the uh, alienating parent and the other phrase is the alienated parent, or sometimes it's referred to as the targeted parent. 
So again, just to introduce some um, um, terminology here as we go along. What's interesting about an alienating parent who's involved in severe alienation is that um, many of these parents will often do anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything, uh, including making false accusations to further their own custody and access agenda in court. These people are mean, they're spiteful, they're vindictive, and they will do anything to undermine the targeted parent's relationship with their children. What I find really interesting about parent alienation, there's many, many different facets of it that I find completely fascinating. Um, but one of the things is that uh, many of these alienating parents in other aspects of their lives can be kind, loving, uh, competent people. So I've seen alienating parents who are respected people in the business world. I've seen alienating parents who are involved in the uh, medical professions um, and very uh, well-educated, articulate, uh, capable people. And um, you would never know just by a first conversation with them that um, that they would even be the capable of, of this type of behavior. Um, and many of these people, what's interesting is that they, they could be involved in charity work in their community. They could be involved in the helping professions. Um, but when it comes to dealing with their ex, these people are spiteful, uh, histrionic, and will stop at nothing to undermine that relationship. So I'd like to ask you folks a question now. Um, have you in your social work practice or in your personal life encountered a situation where severe parent, parent alienation is present? If you would just take a moment, please, and answer that. I'll just give you a few more seconds there now, folks. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, well, let's see the results, shall we? So, wow, 93% of the people who are online here now have come across this situation. And, um, you know, I just think, I think it speaks to how uh, this type of behavior uh, impacts many different people in many different lines of social work practice. So it's not just the people who work for the family court, but it's also um, counselors, perhaps down at the Janeway Family Center or in other parts of the province where you're providing counseling services to children, uh, where you're um, where you're witness to this type of, of, of behavior. Um, Child Protection Services, CSSD, I would imagine sees uh, quite a few of these cases. So, um, yeah, it has implications for uh, many different um, mental health professionals and many in many different professions. Now, there's a follow up question uh, for those of you who have been in practice for 10 years or more who have encountered parent alienation in your practice, would you say that the level of nastiness in such cases compared to cases from 10 years ago is less than 10 years ago, about the same, or more than 10 years ago, the level of nastiness?
Okay, just going to count it down from five now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's see what the results are. Okay, so 67% um, of those polled said that it's uh, more than 10 years ago. And I would, I would have to agree with that. And um, uh, it just seems to me that, that the level of um, complexity of these cases, the level of um, um, venomous anger, uh, the level of um, just pure hatred uh, has really kind of ratcheted up over the last number of years. And part of me wonders, given the fact that I've been doing this work for a long time, part of me wonders, well, is, has it gotten nastier or is just my level of, of patience in working with such people? Uh, maybe I'm just not as patient as, as I once was in terms of uh, dealing with such matters. Um, so I'm trying to be mindful of, of that. But um, as objectively as I can in answering this question, I, I, I think that there is a level of nastiness in these cases that I, I haven't seen in the past. The, the allegations of um, false allegations of, of abuse and sexual abuse and stuff like that, the, I see them more than I used to see in the past. Now, it's, it's important for us to understand that not every parent who attempts to alienate will be successful in their, their attempts. Um, so again, that's the difference between parent alienation, uh, which is the behaviors of the parent, and parent alienation syndrome, which is how it affects the child. But even if it is unsuccessful, these people can wreak havoc in the targeted parent and, and children's lives. Now, I, I'd like to take a moment, if, if, if I may, just to talk about the whole concept of uh, parent alienation syndrome. Um, so while some professionals in the mental health community support the diagnosis of PAS, others argue that having a diagnosis of PAS is not valid clinically and does not meet the academic rigor of the syndrome designation. So I guess one of the questions that we often ask ourselves in situations like that is, well, what does the DSM-5 say? You know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And so there were attempts in 2013 uh, when the DSM manual was, was updated, there were attempts to try to get PAS uh, included as an accepted condition. Um, but um, that was not successful. The P, if you look at the DSM-5, parent alienation sy syndrome is not there. Okay, so there are some people who say, well, uh, if it's not there, then parent alienation syndrome must not exist because it's not recognized by the American Psychiatric Association. So um, if you take this line of thinking to its logical conclusion, then lying, cheating, and manipulative behavior must also not exist, because guess what? They're not in the DSM-5 either, okay? So it's important for us to make a distinction between um, certain categories of human behavior and, human, and the human condition, okay? There are mental illnesses where people suffer from schizophrenia, and other behaviors like that, other mental illnesses like that. Uh, there are some mental health disorders like borderline personality disorder. And then sometimes there are just plain old character flaws, okay? So for example, the husband who can't keep it in his pants, he isn't mentally ill and he does not suffer from a mental disorder. He's just a shitty husband who can't be trusted. Now, um, I, I put this slide uh, in here for two purposes, okay? One is just to kind of tell it like it is, 
to underscore what I mean when I talk about a, a character flaw. Um, but you might think, well, that's kind of an interesting slide to, to put into a uh, professional presentation. One of the things that I've been wondering about over the past year or so is the way that we as social workers in our profession present ourselves. Um, so we're all university educated. We all have our university degrees and we all want to present ourselves in a professional manner. And we also want to um, uh, write when we write court reports and what have you, we want to, to write in a professional manner. And all of that is good. I mean, that's, that's, we are a profession and we should present ourselves professionally. Okay. But I guess one of the things that I've been wondering out, out loud about lately is, you know, in our, in our interest, in our, and in our desire to present ourselves in a professional manner, is there a risk of perhaps glossing over certain things that, um, should not be glossed over. So let me give you an example, okay? We can say in a report that a lady was the victim of domestic violence. And there's nothing wrong with presenting it that way. But what would it be like if we actually wrote in a report, you know what, this lady, her ex-husband, he really beat the crap out of her. Like she's black and blue. She's got bruises all over her face. She's got bruises all over her body. She's got a spiral fracture on her arm. This guy really, really beat her up bad. Now, what would it be like if we presented in that manner? And I'm not suggesting that I have a, a, a straightforward answer, but I guess one of the things that I'm concerned about, especially when I write reports for the court, is that I don't um, gloss over certain things. You know, it's really important for me, and I write a lot of reports. I spend a lot of time in front of my computer uh, writing court documents. And I'm, I'm much more aware lately of not wanting to gloss over certain truths. And so do I say this person has been, this lady has been the victim of domestic violence, or do I say, you know what? She really got beat up bad. She really, really, she's got bruises all over and stuff like that. And I'm just more aware of wanting to uh, be as descriptive and wanting to tell it like it is as possible. And so I just kind of put that out there for your, for your consideration that I'm much more aware of that now than perhaps I was um, uh, sometime in the past. So. Um, one of the character flaws of someone who is an alienating parent is that fundamentally they are self-centered and, and narcissistic. And the common thread is, is immaturity. So there are some people who are really interested in this academic question of, well, is parent alienation really a syndrome? And does it meet the criteria of a syndrome and stuff like that? And there's nothing wrong with having that kind of an academic discussion if that's something that you're interested in. But for those of us who work on the front line, I think what we've come to understand is that irrespective of the debate, there is general consensus in the social work community and in the family law community that one parent can create an atmosphere in which it is exceedingly difficult for the other parent to maintain a relationship with his or her children in the post-separation environment. Maybe it's called parent alienation, maybe it's syndrome, maybe it belongs to the DSM-5, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But those of us who work on the front line, at some point we need to sidestep that debate and say, look, we know that this stuff exists and we need to figure out a way to deal with it. Those who engage in parent alienation are mothers and fathers, come from all walks of life, and are often intelligent. And that's one of the things that I've noticed is that there's many people who've sat in my office who are extremely well-dressed, extremely articulate, uh, drove in with a BMW, and um, but they're just as capable of um, 
uh, being an alienating parent as, as anyone else. It's not a function of intelligence. It's not a function of being upper class or middle class or, or any of that stuff. Um, uh, it comes from all different walks of life. Now, um, I'd like to get you folks to uh, respond to this question, okay? According to Nicholas Bala of Queen's University, social science supports the notion that, should, that there should be a presumption of equal parenting time unless one parent can prove that shared parenting is not in the child's best interest. So I'm just going to ask you folks to take a moment and go through that and, and see what you think of it. Okay, just gonna give you folks a few more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So, 91% said yes, and in actual fact, the answer is no. So, um, what uh, Nicholas Bala and other social scientists, he's actually a law professor, but there is a general consensus that um, there should be no default position when we begin uh, discussion about what's best for a child. So it, basically what what scholars like uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Bala are saying is that we really need to look at these situations on a, on a case by case basis. So there is research to say that uh, children who have access to both parents in a post separation environment, uh, there's a lot of research to say that um, these children tend to have uh, many positive outcomes associated with having a relationship with both parents. Okay. But despite that, what they're saying is you still have to look at every situation on a case by case basis. So you basically need to start from a neutral point saying what is best for this child, as opposed to saying, well, there's a presumption that equal parenting time is what's best. And unless we prove otherwise, that's what we're going to go with. Okay, so it's still the test is what's best for the child, not okay, equal parenting time unless proved otherwise. Right. So it really forces people like myself who do these parenting capacity assessments to start from that neutral place rather than assuming or presuming uh, that um, there's a certain position that we should take from the very beginning. Okay. Now, um, in 2017, one in three parents had sole custody of their children, usually the mom. Um, and this is based on the general social survey on the family, uh, 2017. Uh, and the remaining had a shared custody arrangement or one parent was simply out of the picture. So um, sole custody is, um, is still um, common and you see it uh, in many situations where um, mom has custody of the kids and dad has some type of an access routine. Um, and I think if you look, say, 20 years ago, you'd see that instead of it being 34%, of sole custody, the number would have been much higher. But slowly that number is, is going down and shared custody arrangements are becoming uh, more popular over time. And I don't think that's a surprise to, to any of you. I'm sure just 
anecdotally, you probably already had a sense that that's how it was, right? What's important to understand about parent alienation is that uh, the alienating parent uh, is usually the person, the parent who has the most contact with the child. However, it's really important for us to understand that PAS is not a mother thing, okay? It's an immaturity thing, okay? And I know most of you have already figured this out by now in your social work practice, but guess what? Immaturity is not gender specific. Uh, men and women are both capable of having character flaws and being immature. I'm sure most of you already knew that before I said it out loud. Now, there are different things associated with parent alienation, and some you'll see in the literature, and some are a little bit more obscure. Some of the things that I've noticed over the years um, that are sort of uh, symptomatic of parent alienation is, um, is the following. How many people here have heard a client or friend or family member say that several years after the breakup, they know that their ex still drives by their home on a regular basis, office in, often in the middle of the night. Now, here's the thing that I want to emphasize, okay? Several years after the breakup. I'm not talking about in the weeks or months after a breakup because, you know, emotions are raw shortly after a breakup, especially if it's been a long-term relationship. But I'm talking about several years after the breakup, this behavior is, is still ongoing. How many people have heard of that? Okay, I'm just going to give you a few more seconds there now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, well, let's see what the answer is. 66% said yes. Okay, well, that's really interesting. Um, I've spent a lot of time, folks, um, reviewing the literature on parent alienation. Um, and this isn't something that I've seen in the literature, but it's something that I've seen in my own practice. One of the things that um, I've observed over the years when I'm sitting down talking to the targeted parent and they're complaining about the alienating parent is they'll say, look, you know, we broke up three or four years ago and uh, look, Brian, you're not going to believe this, but like, they're still driving by my house at two o'clock in the morning. You know, I still see their truck driving by. Um, and, you know, I have a new partner now and somehow they found out about my new, where my new partner lives. And now they're driving by my new partner's place. So it's one of those more obscure um, indicators of parent alienation. You've got someone where it's, it's four years later. The couple broke up four years ago. And despite that, you have um, a, an ex-partner who just can't let go of the relationship. Um, and they, they're just really, really hung up on the fact that, um, you know, this relationship has come to an end. And that's one of the defining features of parent alienation, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's just someone who has just incapable or is unable of letting go of the relationship they had. And so they use parent alienation, they use their kids as, as a weapon uh, to punish their ex-partner for, for, for the breakup. Now, um, if you look at the um, literature as it pertains to parent alienation, you'll see that there are eight primary manifestations 
Um, and uh, I'll just take a moment to mention that if there's anyone here with a particular interest in um, learning more about it, uh, Dr. Amy Baker from New Jersey, Dr. Richard Warshak out of uh, Texas um, uh, have published some incredibly well-written um, textbooks and journal articles on this subject. And uh, they're sort of my go-to people whenever I'm looking for information, current information on parent alienation. Um, but there's eight primary manifestations. There's the campaign of denigration, there's the weak, absurd rationalizations, the lack of ambivalence, the child asserts the decision is their own. There's an absence of guilt uh, from the alienating parent. You have the child's reflexive support for the alienating parent. There's accusations uh, based upon uh, phrasing taken from the alienating parent and the targeted parent's entire family is targeted as well. Now, let's look at these one at a time. The most common form uh, of behavior related to parent alienation is a campaign of denigration, bad mouthing. That's really, let's tell it like it is, that's what it is, to anyone who will listen. So when I'm doing a um, home study, a parenting assessment, and I have consent forms to speak to all the different people involved in the family. Inevitably, I will speak to a teacher who will say, you know, parent A or parent B comes in for parent teacher night and I cannot get them to focus on their child's education and how well they're doing in school. All they want to do is bad mouth their ex. That's all that they're interested in doing, okay? I've also had occasions where the targeted parent will say to me, you know what, Brian, you're not going to believe this, but uh, my boss called me into the office the other day and my ex wrote a letter to him saying that um, I'm being investigated by the police and by child protection services for being a pedophile. And just, I, I can't believe that my ex would do this that they would actually be so, they would have the gall to actually write a letter to my boss and, uh, and, and try to uh, get me fired or get me in trouble at work. But here it is. Referrals to CSD, I'm sure many, many people who work for CSD are, are more than aware of this form of bad mouthing, using CSSD as a weapon. And so you'll have a situation where a parent will make, for example, 13 referrals to CSSD within an eight month period. And the first three, four, five of those referrals may have been action by CSSD to get a sense of what's going on. At some point, they recognize that um, these um, allegations are false. And eventually what often happens in my experience is that many of these referrals, even though they keep coming, they, they get screened out. And so despite the fact that these referrals are screened out, uh, they keep coming. And it's just one thing after another, whatever this person can dream up to make a referral to CSSD, that's, that's what they're going for, okay? Um, inappropriate use of um, emergency uh, protection orders. Um, I had a really interesting case a number of, of years ago, and, and even when I think about it now, I can't, I can't believe that this actually happened. But anyway, here we go. Um, there was this case where um, this father was trying to um, have weekend access to his children. And um, he had um, agreed that uh, the children could live primarily with their mom. And he felt for whatever reason that that was uh, the best situation for his kids. But he wanted to maintain a relationship with his children and he wanted to see them on weekends and maybe a, a midweek visit and, and what have you. And mom was completely opposed to this. Um, 
and uh, you know, a home study had had been done at, at one point, and the investigator, or the assessor, basically said, you know, there's no concerns here. There's really no reason why this dad can't have access to his children. So they went to court, and um, the judge uh, ordered that um, the father could have weekend access. And um, the scene in the courtroom after the judge made that ruling, uh, I wasn't there personally, but I'm told that it was um, it was straight out of a movie in the sense that mom just completely lost it. At one point, they were wondering if they were going to have to call an ambulance to deal with her. She was so distraught. So uh, anyway, the paperwork got done and Skip had a couple of weeks and dad uh, is having his first weekend with his children, the first one in, in a long while. And he's really looking forward to it. So he picks up the kids from school and uh, brings them home and they order some pizza and they're settling in for the night. And um, nine o'clock uh, that evening, he gets a knock on the door and there's two police officers there with an emergency protection order. So what had happened was um, mom waited until after supper, waited until the courts were closed, waited until all the lawyers' offices were closed. Then she called up the police and however she went about convincing the police that her children were in jeopardy um, and convincing them that um, her children were in grave danger, she managed to get an emergency protection order somewhere between supper time and, and nine o'clock. And so then the police showed up at dad's door and dad explained to the police officers that, um, yeah, look, uh, I was just granted um, uh, weekend access in court. It just happened two weeks ago. And the police officer said, well, uh, do you have any documentation to that effect? And dad said, uh, no, I don't. My lawyer does, but I can't get hold of my lawyer right now because it's nine o'clock on a Friday night. So as a result of that, the children were removed by the police and placed with their mom. Now, Monday morning, when the courts opened, when the lawyer's offices opened, dad contacted his lawyer and then they ended up going back to court. And um, mom was chewed out by the judge. And again, I wasn't there, uh, but I can only imagine uh, the way that the judge handled the situation. Cause basically the judge had made a, a ruling had made a court order and mom basically, uh, thumbed her nose at it. Um, so what's, what's really interesting about this situation is that mom had to have known that come Monday morning, what she was doing was going to backfire. Um, but she didn't think that through and she didn't, she didn't even care about that. She just, wanted her kids home and she wanted to uh, stick it to, to her ex-husband. And so in that moment, that's all that she cared about. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting example of, you know, sometimes the people's behavior in these situations are completely irrational, but uh, they engage in this behavior nonetheless. And then there's also occasions when there's um, false allegations of, of sexual abuse. And uh, I've worked with parents who've been falsely accused of child abuse, and there's been an investigation done, uh, and they've been cleared. And you will never meet someone who's been put through the ringer, as it were. You'll never meet someone who's more emotionally exhausted than someone who's been put into that situation, having to prove that they didn't sexually abuse their own children. Now, folks, I've raised the whole issue of an emergency protection order. So I, I do want to say something out loud here just so that we're crystal clear about something. We are all social workers and we all know from our training that domestic violence is a very serious matter. It's generally underreported. And when it is reported, we often only hear the tip of the, uh, the iceberg. OK, so. The literature clearly says that with regard to the substantiation of these claims, studies indicate that the majority of domestic violence and child abuse allegations 
can be substantiated in some manner, even if it's not exactly the way it was presented to us uh, in the very beginning. A lot of times uh, there is uh, some truth to what's being said because the person is legitimately the victim of domestic violence or they know that their children have been abused. Okay. So in other words, the overwhelming majority of people who are victims of domestic violence or, or uh, have seen their children being abused, they're not making it up. Right. And, and I, we all know that to be true from our social work practice. Okay. However, there is a concern within the context of a custody and access dispute of the possibility of fabrication or more commonly exaggeration and biased recall in reporting events in order to support legal claims. And I'm sure many of you who work for CSSD have probably um, had that experience where um, you having received seven, eight, nine, ten referrals from parent A about parent B, you, you realize that there's a custody and access dispute ongoing. And basically one parent is trying to weaponize CSSD services to further a custody and access agenda. So it, it really is important for us to understand that false allegations are less common than the problem of genuine victims who for many reasons are unable to report abuse. So one of the things that I do in completing an assessment is um, I want to assess someone's credibility. And so I, I spend a lot of time focusing in on the details. Um, how specific or vague are the details being provided to me? So if someone says to me, my ex has a criminal record for assault on me and from his ex-girlfriend, and he is known by CSSD because of their past involvement. What this person is doing is they're giving me concrete evidence of a history of someone, um, their ex-husband, their ex-boyfriend, um, who has a history of uh, domestic violence versus the I don't knows. Well, I don't know if he might abuse my kid. I don't know if he's using drugs at his new place. I don't know if he's got people coming and going at all hours of the night. These just very vague general allegations where they're dropping these seeds of doubt and concern without actually taking ownership of it, right? I don't know if it's happening, but it could be. So maybe you should go out and investigate that and see what dirt you can dig up for me in the process. So for me, one of the things that I find really important whenever I'm doing uh, an assessment like this is uh, a detailed chronology is often very useful in investing in investigating abuse allegations. So hopefully uh, one of the parents is someone who is taken uh, really good notes and has kept a journal of all the things that have happened. So whenever someone comes to me at Aspens and Oaks and for counseling and they tell me that they're in the middle of a big time custody and access dispute, the first thing I say to them is keep a journal of everything that happens you know, have a really detailed chronology because at some point you may have someone like me doing an assessment and they're going to want to know the details. So here's an example of a timeline. Um, October of 2016, you've got parents who tentative, tentatively agree to joint custody and they actually put it in an email. So it's, it's in writing. Okay. Okay. So then at some point, mom, um, starts a new relationship. She has a first date with a new boyfriend. That's in December. Then in February, dad learns that mom has a new boyfriend and he's not happy about that. So he applies for full custody and he goes to court and he puts out a full application. No, I've changed my mind. I want full custody now. And mom, who's trying to take the high road here and trying to be child focused says, well, no, I, I don't agree with that, but I still want to have joint custody with you as, as previously agreed, right? So she's trying to do her best to, to maintain something that's amicable. 
So let's say that in March of that year, the judge orders a parenting capacity assessment. Someone like myself is hired. And then in May of that year, the assessor interviews the nine-year-old boy. And he says to the assessor, you know what? I like time spent with my mom and I like time spent with my dad. And dad's mom's new boyfriend. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know him very well, but um, so far so good. And he doesn't really stay overnight whenever I'm at mom's house. You know, I think he only stays overnight when I'm, I'm back at my dad's. But he seems like a nice guy, right? So somewhere in the middle of the, of the uh, assessment, uh, dad FaceTimes his son at mom's house. And uh, he says to his son, so I understand that the, you had a chat with the assessor uh, the other day. How did that go? And the child says, um, uh, yeah, dad, you know, I had a real nice chat with uh, him or her. And um, I told him that I like time with my mom and I like my time with my dad. Right. And dad starts to worry now because, OK, I'm trying to get full custody of my kid. And this uh, home study is not turning out the way that I thought it would. I thought that by now there'd be more um, uh, dirt that I could throw against my ex or more evidence to support my claim. So this isn't going very well. So then all of a sudden, three days later, dad accuses mom's new boyfriend of abuse and files an application for an emergency protection order. So. What's what's interesting in those situations is that just by me providing to the court a detailed chronology of events, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. One of the, th the things that I find is that a lot of times the story tells itself. It's just self-evident. And so people will say to me, well, Brian, why do, why do you do these home studies? Because like you're going to end up in court on a lot of them and and you're going to get grilled by lawyers and you know that's do you really want to get into that um and is there a certain risk as a, as a social worker and in, in taking on this type of work and you know it's 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 not for everyone I, I i totally get that but one of the things that i i've learned over the years is that if if you tell the story correctly with specific details and you're really good about laying out the chronology that for the most part the story tells itself if, if someone is being an alienating parent, then just by telling the story of this happened and then this happened and then this happened, it's pretty obvious to the judge what's going on here. Before I even get to the final part of the report where I start making observations or, or conclusions or whatever, the judge is no dummy. Judge says, okay, well, you know, I see what happened there with that emergency protection order where mom, you know, call the police at nine o'clock at night or whatever the story is. You know, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. And it's almost like my my conclusion at the end of my report. It's almost redundant in the sense that, you know, an intelligent judge already has a clear sense of what's going on. But folks, if you are working with someone who's a victim, who's a targeted parent, please tell them to keep a journal because it's just so important to do that. So another example is um, just um, weak, absurd rationalizations, like my ex doesn't feed my child and he's literally starving over there. Um, well, I don't know many parents who don't feed their kids. You know, there might be a complaint that, you know, my kids are living on French fries over at, at so-and-so's house, but the notion that your kid is not being fed, I mean, there's, uh, there's some things to just sort of make your, your antenna go up and say, really, you know, that's, that's really what you're coming at me with. Like you're, your child is literally not being fed over at the other person's house. And some of these things are just really nonsensical in the way that they're, they're uh, approaching it. Right. Um, one of the, one of the things too, is this notion of uh, a lack of dichotomous thinking. So, you know, I'll say if I'm speaking to a, a father, for example, okay. So, um, your your ex partner your your ex wife she she follows the custody and access routine uh, yes yes she does um, and she uh, takes the kids to hockey and and swimming lessons and gymnastics and stuff like that when the kids have their appointments um, yeah yeah she does that yeah she does that and in terms of paying for her share of 
of these activities, like as agreed to in the in the co-parenting arrangement, she she pays she pays her share. Is 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 that correct? Yeah, yeah, she does that. Okay. So despite those three truths, as you just explained them to me, I mean, you've just agreed to me uh, to those three statements. Despite that fact, you can't, you don't have anything positive. You can't say anything positive about your ex. And so this is what you see time and time again, is this, this dichotomous thinking, this, um, there's nothing positive that I can say about my ex-partner. They're just pure evil and they shouldn't be around my youngsters. And they can't even say anything positive, despite the fact that there are positives that are readily apparent. Number four, the child asserts the decision is, is their own. Um, and um, this is where a nine-year-old ch well, child will say, yeah, I just, I hate, I hate my dad's new girlfriend. She's, she just, She's a slut who hangs out on George Street. And it's like, you know, a nine-year-old doesn't even know where George Street is and doesn't know what a slut is either, but he doesn't mind using those words because he's heard them before. So that this brings us to the next question that I have in our polling, folks. How many of you interviewed a child at one time or another, either because you work for CSSD or perhaps you provide counseling for children or what have you? How many of you have interviewed a child where it appears obvious that the child has been coached by one or both of, his, of their parents? So if you could just take a moment and, and answer that question. Okay, a few more seconds there now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Wow, 88% said yes. Okay, so it's, it happens. It, it's, it's common and um, it's, um, it's really disturbing when um, when you're sitting down with a child and you just know instinctively uh, that they've been coached very heavily coached often to uh, to say whatever it is they're going to say. And what's interesting is that I've heard some counselors say or some uh, uh, social workers at CSSD say that, you know, they they'll they'll sit down with a kid and the child hasn't even got their coat off and they're saying, yeah, I, I, I hate my mom or I hate my dad. And they, they feel that they've got this agenda. Like I've, I've got to remember what I'm supposed to say. And they don't even have their coat off and they're out blurting it out because they've been told, make sure you say this or that. It's really quite sad, actually. So uh, another um, uh, example here uh, or, or feature of parent alienation is just an absence of guilt. And so one of the things that I find interesting about people who are engaged in, in parent alienation is just this sense of moral superiority, the, this very sanctimonious approach to I'm right, everyone knows I'm right, and anyone who disagrees with me is completely incompetent and doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and I think that's one of the other features that I notice not so much in the literature, but in my own practice, that I, I work with a lot of alienating parents whenever I'm doing these assessments, where um, there's just this sanctimonious, um, I'm right, and how could you disagree with me? That kind of approach. Uh, and th these people are so married to their point of view that even obvious facts they're just simply not willing to consider. Uh, number six, the child voices support for everything that the uh, alienating parent says, even things that are preposterous. Um, accusations taken from phrasing from the alienated parent, like a seven-year-old child says, daddy's girlfriend is a homewrecker. They have no idea what a homewrecker is, but that's what they'll say. Um, 
And one of the really difficult things that I notice is the targeted parents' entire family is, is targeted as well. And I've sat down with a number of grandparents over the years at their kitchen table. Uh, sometimes I'll do home visits in, in rather than having people come to, to my office. And it's just gut wrenching for, for grandparents. You know, I haven't seen my grandkids in over a year. I'm not allowed to see them. And, and I just, it's just, it, it just tears your heart out to listen to parents, to grandparents say, I, I, I can't see my grandkids. And the, but this is one of the features of, of parent alienation. Now, folks, um, I, I want to make sure that there's time left over for uh, Q&A, and I see that there's only 25 minutes left here. So I'm going to kind of move on a little bit here. Um, I mentioned that um, a lot of people who are alienating parents um, are not uh, mentally ill and they don't have a mental disorder. A lot of them, this is a character flaw. But having said that, it's also uh, noteworthy in the literature that a number of alienating parents have characteristics of borderline personality disorder. Okay. Um, so I have a little question for you here now. Um, when I graduated from Munn with my BSW, I had a good understanding of BPD. Who, I'm wondering if you could just sort of take a moment and, and answer this question. Okay. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And 94% said no. And that would be how I would answer the question too. And, and I'm not saying this now to be critical of our, of our, uh, education. I mean, we all, um, uh, you know, you, you, you graduate and you have a certain amount of knowledge that, that comes with that. Uh, but I, you know, especially in my first seven or eight years in, in practice, because I worked on the front line in, in child protection in my 20s, I, I wish that I had known more about borderline personality disorder back then uh, than I did. Um, and since that time, I've, I've, I've done a lot of reading and, and uh, attended seminars about BPD. Um, th there's a lot of people who engage in alienating behavior who, who suffer from borderline personality disorder. And it's very, very common. Uh, so many of these people are antisocial, uh, borderline histrionic or narcissistic personality disorder. Um, but borderline is probably the, the most common. And so I'm just going to flick through these. Um, characteristics of BPD. Um, and I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but the second one I think is probably the, the most important one is that there's a pattern of unstable interpersonal relationships uh, characterized by alternating, alternating between extremes of idealiza idealization and devaluation. And this is called splitting. So when they're going out with this person, I love this person, this person's amazing, they're my BFF, they're my soulmate, and then they break up, and it's like, this person is the scum of the earth, right? I never want to see this person again. They're the devil, and it's it's quite it's stark. It's there's no gray area in between. You're either my friend or you're my enemy. And now that we've broken up, we're enemies, and that's how it, it's going to be. Okay. So again, that was really the one that I wanted to highlight the most here. Um, but there's other, uh, features as well. And number eight, inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling your anger. And you'll see this over and over again in alienating parents. They are as angry as venomously angry four years after the breakup, when they're talking about the breakup as when it first happened. 
So one of the uh, sources of controversy in dealing with um, parent alienation is that it's important that the term itself is not weaponized and used indiscriminately to children who may reject a parent regardless of the type of the rejection or the reason for it. So rather than asking what may be the underlying cause of the child's resistance to have child uh, the kind of contact with a parent, the question usually becomes, is the alleged alienating parent guilty or not guilty of parent alienation? So what an assessor needs to do, okay, rather than just assuming that alienation is occurring because there's a little Johnny or a little Janie who is resistant to having contact with their dad, for example, um, are there other possible explanations why little Johnny or little Janie do not want to spend time with their dad for weekend access? And so there's the following eight categories that may explain this situation. So uh, the first, so it's really, when you think of parent alienation, it's not only is it present, but it's also by process of elimination, uh, excluding other possibilities or other reasonable explanations for why a child may not want to spend time with a particular parent. So, for example, a, a normal separation anxiety. You know, a child may really, really enjoy going over to their dad's house and spending time with their dad and going out to swimming and stuff like that. But um, they just want to sleep in their own bed. The, you know, it's an anxious child and whatever it is about their own unique personality, they just want to be in their own bed at the end of the night. That's just who they are as a, as a youngster. And dad doesn't recognize that. He just feels like, well, I'm entitled to my full weekend. And so this is what I want, even if my four-year-old child or my five-year-old child um, is really anxious come bedtime because they want to be in their own bed asleep in, in their home. Um, child abuse and neglect. So Amy Baker, who's sort of the, the guru of parent alienation, she's very clear that if child abuse is confirmed any notion of PAS is off the table, okay? Uh, so if it's, if it's a situation where a child is going over to a parent's house on the weekend and there's concerns of neglect or abuse, then you cannot argue that it's a result of parent alienation when uh, a, an, an alternative hypothesis may be abuse or neglect. Number three, a parent's inappropriate behavior or expectations. So I've worked on cases in the past where um, I worked with one family where this dad was saying, you know, we had this really good routine worked out between me and my ex-wife. And it's one week on, one week off. And then that was going great for the longest time. And then my ex-wife, she moved in with her mother. And her mother's house is basically this flop house. Like mom, her mom knows everyone from her community around the Bay. And there's always people coming in and staying over for doctor's appointments, or they want to come in for a weekend of shopping. And the place is just like a hotel. And my kids are there and they wake up and they go down for breakfast. And there's all these strangers there. And they really are really uncomfortable. And they, they've always enjoyed time with their mom. But now that mom is living with, with their grandmother and and grandma's house is, is this basic hotel, like the kids are really, really uncomfortable there. And so the kids start voicing concern about going over there. So that's an example of, of a situation where it's not alienation, it's just, yeah, there's there's something going on in the other home that makes the children feel uncomfortable. Um, Domestic violence might be present in a situation which may make the children feel scared about going over to the other home. Um, another situation which I find really interesting is you may have a situation where um, uh, a couple have this routine that's been on the go for a long time and it's been very good and it's been very functional. But now we're in a situation where the kids are in their teens and the notion of this one week on, one week off, it doesn't work anymore. Like I'm 13 years old and I wanna spend time with my friends on the weekend. I don't wanna to have to, 
you know, go over to this person's house or go to that person's house. And I want to be with my friends. But if I go over to that house, my friends are now a half hour away and I'm missing out on parties and stuff like that. Um, and so this is something that becomes an issue as kids get older. So I have a question for you folks. Um, how many of you know of a shared custody arrangement that you are familiar with, either personally or from your own practice, where the custody arrangement has been in place for five years or more? Think of, of one in particular. Yes, I know of such a shared custody arrangement or, or no, I don't. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Okay, so 70% of you know of such an arrangement. Okay, so I have a follow-up question now. For those of you who answered yes, how many of these shared custody arrangements that you are aware of are more or less the same even years after they were put in place? So let's say you have a situation where the kids were only preschoolers when this arrangement was put in place, and now the kids are moving into their teen years. And how many of you have a situation where they still have the same custody arrangement in place, despite the fact that the kids are getting older? Five, four, three, two, one. Sixty-eight percent, which is probably what I would have guessed, actually. So one of the things that I've I've noticed is, um, and I've come across a number of these cases in in recent years, parents who've had this really well-oiled, well-functioning routine that's been in place for years and years and years, and suddenly. The kids become teenagers and all of a sudden there's this big racket. Uh, what do you mean it doesn't work anymore? And one of the things I find really interesting about these custody and access arrangements is that once they're developed, people get used to them very quickly and they mold their lives very tightly around them. They get used to them. And even if your kids get older and it no longer works for them, people are very, very resistant to changing them. Even tweaking them just a little bit can be a really, really big deal for some people. And so what I often say to people is, folks, if you can get five or six years out of a routine, that's great. But when your kids hit their teen years, be prepared to start tweaking something because very likely that's what you're gonna to have to do. Then there's alienation via third parties, like a mom's boyfriend or a dad's new girlfriend uh, doesn't like the idea of their ex, uh, their, their boyfriend's ex being involved in their lives and they become jealous and they start undermining the whole relationship uh, that the children have with the other parent. Um, or this whole situation of the kids becoming involved and playing one parent off against the other trying to um, you know, deal with the parent who's gonna let them have their own way. Sometimes that happens, but not too often. But one of the things that's particularly common is a fear of the absent parent. And I see this many, many times. So I've worked with many, many parents over the years, dads in particular, who will say, you know, my child comes over for the weekend and they get 30 texts from their mom during the weekend, you know? How are you? How are things? I miss you. I wish you were here. And the dad will say, like, the child can't just relax and settle into my house for the weekend because they're constantly responding to to mom's texts. 
And so this leads to another question that I have here. Um, just bear with me. How many of you know a child 10 years or older, either from professional or personal contact, who worries and frets about the well-being of one of their parents because of a shared custody arrangement? The child worries about parent A when they are with parent B, or the child worries about, worries about their parents' financial circumstances, which has been shared with the child, or the child's worried about their parents' love life, which has been shared with them, or they're concerned about one or both of their parents drinking. How many of you know of a, such a child 10 years or older? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. 63%. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting is sort of the, you know, the, the dynamics of parent alienation and of these home studies are, are always changing. But if you were to ask me, what is the thing that I've noticed the most over the last two years in terms of something new on the scene? This is the thing that I would probably notice the most, that there's parents saying, you know, like, my child just can't come over to my house and relax because they're constantly being receiving texts from the other parent. Are you okay? Is everything okay? I miss you. This kind of stuff. Like I've seen a lot more of that than, than I ever did. And perhaps it's just simply a function of, of the fact that children have smartphones and they're easily accessible by the other parent. And so fear of the, of the absent parent uh, is a concern for, for, for many children. So folks, I, I could go on because there's a few more things that I wanted to talk about, um, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, I put together this presentation and it's been a while since I've, I've um, I have presented this before, but it was several years ago. And I really didn't know how long it was gonna take me to go through this. So there's a few more slides that I have uh, but I think I've covered the gist of what parent alienation is all about. So I'm going to leave it here. And instead of going through the rest of my slides, what I'm going to do is simply say, um, uh, let's, let's leave it at that. And I'm just wondering if there's any, any questions that any of you folks have in the remaining time that we do have. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, for that excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions that's, that have come in. Um, so our first question is, can, um, just give me one second there now, can parental alienation refer to biological parents and foster parents? Example, biological parent targeting foster parents or vice versa, or does PA only occur in situations where there is a breakdown in an intimate relationship? Um, no, excellent, excellent question. Um, and the answer is yes. You could have a situation where um, a child has developed a, a bond with a caregiver, a foster parent, and one parent feels threatened by that bond, by that uh, emerging relationship. And so you'll have a situation where one parent will tend to overtly or covertly undermine that relationship because they feel threatened by it. And what you'll often see is the same similar mm -hmm. behaviors um, uh, as if the uh, targeted parent was was the biological parent, but instead they're, they're a caregiver or a foster parent. Yeah, so good question. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question is, what are your thoughts uh, or experience with safe place agreements or comfort contracts? as a tool to help parents be more child focused. Also, what are, what are the implications for court? Um, I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Safe space contracts? I, I don't know what you're referring to, sorry. Safe place <laughs> agreements or comfort contracts is what the, the person asked. Maybe if they wanna 
chime back in and provide some clarification around that question. Uh, so we can move on while we're waiting for, uh, okay. for that clarification. Um, sure. So someone else wants to know what role, if any, does unresolved grief and loss play in parental alienation? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's a, it's a really good question actually, because a lot of times when I'm hired to do, um, an assessment, it's sort of like the, the tool of last resort. So many times when I take on an assessment, I'll learn that the breakup occurred four years ago or five years ago. And, and so it's not uncommon in the first year or even two years after a separation for people to grieve the loss of the marriage, to grieve the loss of the long-term relationship, and to have some pretty crazy behavior go on during that time. Um, people being uh, mean and vindictive and what have you and being angry. And, and of course, a lot of times anger, as we know, if we scratch below the surface of anger, a lot of that, a lot of that is, is, is hurt. Uh, and, and grief at the loss of the relationship being expressed in the form of anger. Okay. But what we have in this situation, four years, four years down the road, I mean, most people four years after a breakup, they've gotten on with their lives. Right. But for, for the alienating parent, when I'm sitting down with them and it's four years later, they are as venomously angry about the breakup as the day that it occurred. And really when you scratch below the surface of that anger, what you have is someone who's hurt and is still grieving the loss of that, of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, just going down through the questions. Uh, there's some comments that, uh, was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, someone says amazing presentation. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any more questions and I didn't get any more clarification around that other question. So maybe that's something we can follow up with, uh, after the presentation, Brian. Um, and we can look at that, that question again. Uh, so in the interest of time, I guess, and there's no additional questions, we can, um, wrap things up. And uh, did you have any final comments before I do uh, some wrap up comments, uh, Brian? Um, no, um, I, I guess I am curious of the people who are here. Um, this uh, assessment work is, is it's fascinating, folks. I know that assessment work is not for everybody. Uh, you're, you spend a lot of time working with families, you write long reports, and sometimes you end up in court. I've been in court on a lot of these. And and some people like going to court and some people don't. But if you have an interest in this type of work, um, it's a very small group of us. And that small group is getting smaller because people are retiring. If you have an interest in this line of work, I'd like to talk to you. I really, I really would because there is, there is space. There's a lot of space actually uh, uh, in this circle of, of need for, for people who, who need to do, who, who are willing to do this type of work. Um, and, uh, if you're willing to do it, um, please contact me because, um, we'd love to have you seriously. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. Um, so just to wrap things up, I do want to thank Brian for this informative and excellent presentation and for sharing his knowledge, experience and expertise regarding parent alienation with us today. It's always so wonderful when we can come together um, with our social work colleagues and enhance our knowledge and skills while cel celebrating the profession, particularly now during Social Work Month. Parent alienation is an issue that social workers across diverse fields of practice have seen in their work and interventions with families is important in ensuring the health and well-being of children and youth. So Brian, you shared a lot of important information that we can reflect on, and we hope that this session sparked, you know, everyone's interest in continuing to learn more uh, on this topic. I do want to say that the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation is available on the resource section of the webinar platform along with uh, the NLCSW standard document on custody and access assessments, which Brian would have been part of back in the day when we uh, developed that document. And I uh, just want to know that that document is going to be updated uh, in light of the new Divorce Act and some of the language changes around some of that. Uh, members may claim one point CPE credit uh, 
credits under the required category of work workshops as per the NLCSW CPE policy for attending the webinar. And we also hope that you'll complete the evaluation form that will appear on your screen uh, because your feedback is always so greatly appreciated. So on that note, I uh, just want to say thanks again for everyone uh, for attending, uh, to Brian for giving up his time uh, and sharing uh, his knowledge again with us today. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and happy Social Work Month again.